sorry, Wilmot's questions. Um, our committee, one of our recommendations was, your committee recommends that government consider referring all future research proposals on the impacts of high capacity wells to the Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability. And our committee asked that we could take, we could see the terms of reference for the uh, pr uh, proposed study that would take place. Minister, are, the, are these terms of reference complete? The Honorable Minister of Environment, Energy, Climate Action. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, no, they're not. We're, we're going to pull together a committee, and it's going to have a variety of, uh, of experts kind of leading the committee from watershed groups to, uh, to agriculture to water experts right across the province. Uh, they'll come up with the terms of reference, and once we have them, we will submit them to a committee. But like I stated earlier, that does not mean we're, the work stops. You're welcome to uh, provide input, but we, uh, we're not waiting for you. If you want to, uh, if you, if you want to give us uh, your feedback, do it quickly because the, the vote is leaving the dock right away. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. S Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I guess my name's now Maggie. Uh, the, the Water Act and the new regulations were released on a Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock, um, usually when government wants to push something out without many people knowing about it. And I'm happy to hear that the minister is going to make these, uh, will send the terms of reference to the committee. Um, I'm not sure why he is, because he said he doesn't even want to listen to what we have to say. Minister, if you send these to a committee, will you actually listen to what the committee has to say? The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A lot of things to unpack in, that, in those statements. I guess uh, the Honourable Member over there is getting his questions from Kerry Campbell. The only other person who's talked about the 3 o'clock is, is Kerry. Uh, we tried to actually put it out on, on Thursday. We had caucus. You were at it. I talked about it at a caucus upstairs that we were trying to do it. We got fetched up and we couldn't get it out that day. The earliest we could get it out was Friday because I have two small children and I had to arrange for them to, to get fed and be... <laughs> And be in Charlottetown, uh, I, that was the earliest I could possibly do it. And we had CBC lined up to, to do an interview. I had to get to my office. And uh, I had to take my better half with me and twins to, to feed in one room while I was trying to do an interview in the other room. So it's, mu it's much less sinister than you and Carrie Campbell think it is. Um, it was, uh, it was a, a victim of my own circumstances that, that, that created that. But uh, to, the committee, to go back to the committee, uh, committees report, report to this House and give recommendations to this House. Uh, you may think that you give them directly to ministers or whatever, and that's fine if you, if you want to, uh, to continue to believe that. Uh, any good advice I'm always willing to take. You know you've worked with me for a number of years. We actually coached a hockey team together probably 12 years ago when you were 14 years old, so we've known each other for a long time. <laughs> you know that I'm always open to good advice, so if you can get that committee to provide good advice, it will be taken. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Montague, your second supplementary. So I would, get, I would take it that the Minister uh, sees that the groups that we met with, uh, groups right across PEI, farmers, uh, scientists, that their advice is no good. Uh, Mr. Speaker, so the Minister said that he would, he would send this to committee, he would make this public. I think we're happy to hear that. Um, Obviously, we're under a short time frame with uh, what the committee can report back to, 90 days. Um, we are quite happy that the minister did move forward and finally uh, set a date to have this act come into effect. That's it's very positive. Minister, again, if you send, when you send the terms of reference to a committee that we can look at it, will you actually take our advice seriously? The Honorable Minister of Environment, Energy, Climate Action. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think I've kind of outlined that, that any advice that I would take would have to be reasonable. So I'll, I'll start from, uh, from that point. That, that's our jumping point, that any reasonable advice will not be, uh, will not be sent back. Um, uh, you know, as far as the act itself goes and the, the precarious period that we kind of have ourselves in because it doesn't actually come into effect until June, um, one of the uh, previous opposition members who now sits over here made the, made the change to the bill when it was on the floor when it first came in to to do that 90-day period, I would have liked to have had everything go in uh, on the day that we, we, we uh, took it to Cabinet, but that wasn't, wasn't possible. Um, but yeah, I think it's safe to say that, as I had said previous, if there's, if there's something reasonable, then we're going to hear it out. We also have a group of experts who sit around a table in my office who do this for a living, who went to school for this, who are really smart at this. And uh, I'm going to lean pretty heavily on, on their advice, but if there's something you can do that would trump 
the advice of experts, then uh, yeah, I'd look at it. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Town Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government promised to be bold in its uh, attempts to fix the mental health and addiction system on PEI. They promised to use evidence in every decision they make. Question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. What exactly is your definition of evidence? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for the question. What my definition of evidence is, is taking the advice that we have as uh, a minister sitting ahead of me has said, we have experts in our departments that provide feedback. When I make a decision, when we as a government make a decision, Mr. Speaker, we certainly we have to take uh, the advice of the experts into account when we're making those decisions. And across the board, Mr. Speaker, that is what this government does. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Time Valley, Sherbrooke. Well, that's interesting. With a background in research myself, I was excited to hear health bureaucrats brag to a legislative committee recently about a research project that analyzed the lived experiences obtained prior to launching police first mobile mental health crisis teams. Question to the same minister, do you know how many people were included in this research project? Do you know how many questions they were asked? The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm not sure if I heard the Honourable Member uh, correctly, but I do believe that she used the word brag. Am I correct there? I, anyway, we'll leave that as it may be. When members appear before the committee, Mr. Speaker, before any committee, I don't think that they're there to brag. They are there to provide the information to answer the questions that are forthcoming from committee members. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's right across the board, Mr. Speaker. I'm quite sure that the uh, member is referring to the mobile mental health units, which we are moving forward on, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as I've uh, said here a couple of times in the legislature previously, Mr. Speaker, that that will be taking place, that those units will be on the road sooner, much sooner rather than later. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Town Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And yes, I did use the word brag and my tone was intended to be critical. Honestly, Mr. Speaker, four people, one family, four questions each. That's it, that's all we asked. Honestly, Mr. Speaker, I could get a larger, larger sample by asking the other members of this House about their struggles with mental health. And since we have no idea how these participants were selected, it might just be as representative. This isn't even a solid effort at a research project that was meant to inform one of the most sought after services on PEI, not to mention the expert recommendations against a non-police, uh, against a police-led model that were completely ignored. If they were looked at at all, Question to the Minister, is your department's attempt to check a box, is this an attempt just to check a box that says you're evidence-based? And do you really think the quality of this work is going to pass Islanders' expectations of you? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, it disappoints me that uh, we look at uh, the line of questioning with regard to experts in the department who present it to a standing committee. Are we always going to have different uh, opinions? Are we going to be able to re uh, receive uh, expert advice with that expert advice giving different direction? Absolutely, that's going to take place. But Mr. Speaker, as we launch for mobile response units, certainly we have to prioritize safety. That safety has to be with regard to not only the clients, to the islanders that we are serving, but it also has to prioritize safety for uh, the workers that are responding, Mr. Speaker. And I will say, Mr. Speaker, that as we move forward on this, we will continue to monitor. We will always have to be open to making changes, to making improvements in any service that government provides. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have one more question. Um, final. He didn't say final. Yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry. Okay. So, yes, so my question is in response to this then. So, um, 
So you mentioned Islanders with lived experience. You mentioned needing to engage with those who are actually working on the front lines. I didn't hear that any of that was actually done uh, beyond these you know, few interviews. Uh, you listened to a few experts in your department, but this is a huge initiative, civil incredibly sir, important. Sir, sir, and sir, there is a considerable amount of evidence now. across Please the country no, that will tell you what it is uh, in terms of best Working practices when you plan. implement a new model. So I didn't hear that any of that work was done, and I am incredibly concerned that we can consider four interviews with one, with four people and one family, enough to say, yeah, we understand the lived experience of Islanders who will be engaging with this service. So question to the Minister of Health. Will you be doing any further consultation? Will you be engaging with Islanders who have lived experience so that you can really understand what is needed for Prince Edward Island? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And you, you know, you look at the motion that was brought forward here by the official opposition the other day. And what does it state? Toxic work environment. The people that Islanders are not being treated appropriately by staff. We have a fantastic civil service, Mr. Speaker, and I just want to emphasize that. Mr. Speaker, when you look at the grassroots input, you look at the speech from the throne that was tabled when uh, this legislative sitting opened, and you look at the initiatives with regard to health care and with regard to mental health and addictions in particular, and let's look at one of them, the PEI Center for mental well-being, and that is going to provide an opportunity for experts, for government, for our great civil servants as well to provide input, but Mr. Speaker, also for the grassroots, the ones that live in this day in and day out and deal with it, to be able to provide input back to us with regard to gaps that may be existing in the system that we then can act upon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of question. Statements by Minister. The Honorable Minister of Edu Education, Lifelong Learning, the Minister responsible for the status of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize Monday, March 8th, as International Women's Day. International Women's Day is an opportunity to recognize women leaders, women who help from the shadows, women whose voices are heard from the rooftops, and women whose soft whispers have provided comfort through these tough times. Due to the pandemic, celebrations will look different from past years. The International Women's Day Organizing Committee brings advocacy and celebration online this year with a podcast series featuring five exceptional women and gender diverse people sharing their perspectives and experiences. To listen, Islanders can go to the PEI Advisory Council on the Status of Women Facebook page. Additionally, I want to encourage MLAs and all Those Islanders to celebrate the diverse Those voices sandwiches. and contributions women have made and continue to make in our lives by posting on social media and using the hashtag IWDPEI. Mr. Speaker, the International Women's Secretariat provides annual grants to community organizations for direct services and programs that enhance awareness, education, and social action in our province. This year, eight community organizations will receive funding through the, through the Interministerial Women's Secretariat grant. They are Women's Network PEI, PEI Coalition for Women in Government, PEI Women, Business Women's Association, STEAM PEI, East Prince Women's Information Center, Sport PEI, Adventure Group, and Action Femme, Lille le Prince Edouard. Here is how the organizations will use this funding. Women's Network PEI will develop an annual training for men and boys interested in engaging in violence prevention. The PEI Coalition for Women in Government will shed light on the political process by creating and sharing a number of adaptable resources and tools, as well as one-on-one -on -one mentoring opportunities. This project will help diverse candidates who typically find themselves unable to break into politics and are often discouraged from getting involved. PEI Business Women's Association's project will seek to attract young women under 30 years of age, including recent post-secondary graduates in PEI, newcomers to the island and BIPOC community and the BIPOC community who have created a business or are thinking of creating one by developing business leadership skills they need to thrive during this challenging time. STEAM PEI will develop and deliver two extracurricular math programs 
a series of after-school classes focused on play-based and practical life math for students identifying as female in kindergarten and grade one, plus a series of lunchtime classes focused on growth mindset around math for grades five and six. The East Prince Women's Information Center will provide a training opportunity in person and online to develop strong leadership skills. Sports PEI's project is focused on organizing a number of workshops and group coaching to female leaders in sport. Adventure Group will use the grant for the Adventure in Kindness, Learning Empathy and Leadership During the Pandemic project. Action Femme, Lille de France Edouard, will use the grant for a social reconnection project that was designed for Acadian and Francophone women in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank all of the recipients and all the people who work to advance equality for girls and women on Prince Edward Island. And I look forward to seeing the outcomes of these projects. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In my opening statement, I talked about how awesome and amazing island identifying people are and how they've been especially so over the pandemic for the past year. Now I would love to see that same awesomeness reflected in the actions of the minister responsible for them. I want to stop hearing how much women are valued and I want to see this government show us how much they value people who identify as women by taking action. Grants are not enough. On this International Women's Day, I want to see a women's economic recovery strategy for PEI. I want to see a women's wellness strategy for this province that was promised two years ago. I want to see midwifery implemented across this province. I want the third option available to every woman across the province who wants it and needs it. I want to see the Thousand First Days initiative fleshed out and implemented, hopefully in a way that supports women identifying people and their children. I want this minister responsible for women to publish gender diversity and inclusion targets with measurable outcomes that are annually reported. I want to see us normalize using inclusive language and inclusive actions. The word women and or woman must mean people who identify as women and to include all women representing the diversity of this island, including but not limited to diversity of age, race, religion, sexual orientation, ability and socioeconomic background. We keep hearing about how this government uses a gender-based analysis, but do they truly understand why this matters, other than because I've been harping? Do you understand why it matters? I don't see the action I expect from a government using this lens, even if I know it's new, but I still don't see that. And I don't know what targets or benchmarks have, have been set for themselves, and I look forward to seeing more and hearing more about this. The PEI Advisory Council on the Status of Women monitors the PEI government's overall actions towards gender equality over time. Their goal is to collaboratively work with governments to help the province achieve high grades in all priority areas. The council presents their results on the, of their assessment in the Equality Report Card. On this International Women's Day, I choose to challenge this government to stop talking about women identifying people and to start taking meaningful actions to make equity for women and women identifying people a priority on PEI. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for bringing this forward. And, and it's an important announcement today about grants, and I, I really think that's important. The grants, uh, these grants are going to go um, a very long way, I think, to, to doing a lot of good work, especially after we're getting out of COVID and we understand um, the tribulations of what COVID-19 did on the women's population. And I, I stand in support of your announcement, and I stand in support of those organizations. And, and yes, we have to do more, and, and, but I do believe in celebration of International Women's Day, we should, we should do just that and celebrate this step, and, and we'll, we'll do more, and I look forward to, to chatting with you about that. Um, these grants are very important, especially um, the Women's Network one about engaging men and boys. 
And uh, I think right now we all have a role to play and I've had discussions with that. I've been part of a group called Man Up and, and the, you know, we, we want to engage more men and boys in this fight. And I think it's a very, very important um, uh, announcement here today and especially with the Sport PEI and, and all the, and all the groups that were announced, and um, I look forward to working with you, and especially the PEI advisory of the Council of the Status of Women. And this is a this is a great announcement, and um, I'd just like to thank the minister and, and all those involved. And happy International Women's Day. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As mentioned yesterday in my speech, I would like to table documents uh, of a release put out by the Leader of the Official Opposition about the importance of the House reconvening in 2020. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir Carey. Sir Carey. Sir Carey. No more tabling of documents. Reports by committees. Introduction of government bills, government motions. The Honourable Minister of a Agriculture, Land, Minister of Justice, Public Safety, and the Eternal General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move, seconded by the Minister of Fisheries and Communities, that pursuant to Section 12.2 of the Justice of Peace Act, the report of the Justice of Peace Pe Remuneration Review Commission dated November 12, 2020, and as tabled on November 26, 2020, be adopted. Shall I carry? The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Honourable Premier that the first order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? <coughs> order number one, adjourned debate on the draft address. The debate was adjourned by the Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I had the opportunity to speak at length yesterday, and I, I'm just going to conclude my remarks today. But I do think, um, given some of the comments that have been made by other members in the House, that there is some clarification required, Mr. Speaker, which is relevant to the previous topics that I was uh, bringing forward around poverty, housing, and equity. And that's this um, what seems to be real confusion about what a minimum wage is and what it's for what a basic income is and what it's for, and what a livable wage is and what it's for. So I'm going to take this opportunity to kind of conclude my remarks by making some, hopefully some clarifications for those who are watching and for the members in the House, um, so even those that have been participating for a number of months now in the uh, Special Committee on uh, Poverty still seem to have some challenges with this. So it's, um, I think it's something, something that, that clearly is difficult. And the more that we talk about it and normalize understanding all these different terms and what they mean, perhaps it'll be easier for us to act, make decisions that will actually benefit islanders. The minimum wage was originally Im, um, implemented to protect workers and ensure that they had a minimum wage that, would, they had, that meant that they could live on what they earned. That's where it came from, and that's why it's so important. We've all agreed, pretty much, I think, in this house that a minimum wage currently is not enough to live on. And in fact, we actually have data um, done uh, by the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, specifically looking at how much it costs to live and what you would need to earn as an hourly wage. And in Charlottetown, that's $19.30 an hour, which is a pretty far cry from the $13 an hour that we'll be at as of April 1. Let me be clear before I am quoted in any way, Mr. Speaker, I am not suggesting that we immediately implement a minimum wage of $19.30, though that would be great. I am obviously also an economist and realistic that there needs to be a bridge from where we are now to achieving a wage. And so some of the other measures that I've been talking about are things that we do to do that. Mr. Speaker, a, um, a basic income was significantly researched, discussed, presented, and we have an extensive report presented in this House and table that goes through exactly how um, and why a basic income is something that we should have as a tool in our toolbox for PEI. But that report made it abundantly clear that a basic income is not the only solution to poverty. It is not a huge, great, big bandage that will fix everything that we have here. It is a very large tool but it is one tool of many. 
that report made it very clear that we would need to retain and potentially even expand other programs that support islanders with needs that would not be met by a basic income alone. A great example of that are the additional supports that are provided to disabled islanders who would require those, report, those supports to continue. So when we talk about a basic income, we need to be really clear that we are talking about providing a foundational income for all islanders so that they are not in poverty. It is literally the base foundation to ensure that islanders do not suffer from poverty. It would not be replacing um, a minimum wage in any way because the ability to work has nothing to do with whether or not you should be in poverty. What a, minimum, what a basic income does is ensure that no one is poor anymore. When they work, the money they earn should be paid at or above a minimum wage, whatever that minimum wage is. And they should have the employment supports and rights and standards that anyone should be afforded when they work. When they work, th that money they earn is on top of that basic income and our report was very clear that a basic income would be reduced until um, it was no longer required because somebody is earning enough. So there is no connection between how much we pay people on, as a minimum wage and the need for a basic income. We recognize that those two things work together to make our economy stronger. Mr. Speaker, it also means that things like programs like the child tax benefit, which has done a, the most uh, impactful thing that has happened for child poverty in Canada ever, um, would continue. EI would continue. These are programs that provide alternative forms of income. In fact, they are in their own way a form of, of an income support. Uh, the child tax credit, OAS, GIS, these are all ways that we provide income to islanders in need now. They are not sufficient, but they have a huge impact and they would not be removed. We are not in a position where we would consider taking away programs that do the right thing for islanders. In the long term, if we are able to bring basic income as a tool into our toolbox, Mr. Speaker, then yes, we may see the end of social assistance. And that is not a bad thing. But in the interim, we are not in a position to suggest that we get rid of anything. What we are in a position to do is to suggest that it's time that we start thinking about all the different tools that we have in the toolbox. It will take a long time, hopefully not too long, but it will take a long time for us to get to the point where we have a basic income in place that is solid and a part of our uh, social justice system um, in which we can start unpacking some of the other things. So the list of actions that I identified ye yesterday, Mr. Speaker, around social assistance, around accessibility supports, around low income supports, housing, community services, and equity, those are all tools as well. And those are tools that we can start implementing now, next week, next month. We do not have to wait for some federal government official to come in on their white horse and save us. We are perfectly capable of doing great things now by taking good action now. And anything we do is going to mean that there are fewer islanders 